to episode 214 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I'd like to thank some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Arlie Kinchelo Tierney, Maria Ramirez, Mackenzie, Siobhan Lawrence, Prince Hoey96, Martha Summerlin, Matt Dobbs, Mark Laurie, Janine Rosen, Satu Anderson, Anne Endicott, Cheryl Bazaki, Kathy Rowe, Barbara E. Samaniego, Johan Solo, Izzy, Mary Taylor Assernow, Elena Carter, Jess Jess, and Aaron Williams. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And we have got a promo this week. This week's promo is for I See Bad Movies. Join Emma and David as they dive into the world of bad movies. They watch them so you don't have to. I See Bad Movies is, of course, the podcast of our wonderful friend, Dave Keane, who has been on the podcast numerous times, who used to do 50p Movie Club with Dan and who now has a podcast called I See Bad Movies, which is exactly what it says on the tin. So for season one, they looked at paranormal movies specifically. For season two, they went for killer inanimate objects and they watched films like Rubber, which is about a killer tire. That's not a joke. That's exactly what it is. And it's regularly brought up on the Real Life Ghost Stories Supergroup. And season three, they looked at killer animals. So if you love the world of bad movies and you want to listen to some lighthearted, lovely reviews of these bad movies, then I See Bad Movies is for you. Have a listen to their promo. Go and follow them and listen to them wherever you get your podcasts. The link to listen will be in the description of this episode as always. And I hope you enjoy their promo. David, I want to tell you my secret now. Okay. I see bad movies. In your dreams? No. Well, you're awake? Yes. Bad movies like Climb to Geist, Killer Sofa? On streaming services like regular movies. They don't have decent budgets. They don't edit their scripts properly. The main character is usually the writer, producer and director. They don't know they're bad. How often do you see them? All the time. And you can too. <laughs> <laughs> Look for I See Bad Movies wherever you get your podcasts. And join me, David. And me, Emma, as we dive into some of the most iconic... And not so iconic bad movies around. We watch them so you don't have to. Listen to I See Bad Movies wherever you get your podcasts. As an aside, it took Dave Keane about a bazillion years to actually just send me that promo. And when he did eventually send it, he was like, Oh, I hope it's good. I hope it's not shit. It's such a good promo. So go and listen to I See Bad Movies and follow them on social media, wherever you get your podcasts, etc, etc. And our film review this week, our film review is No One Will Save You. No One Will Save You was released in 2023. It has 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb and 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. No One Will Save You introduces Bryn Adams, a creative and talented young woman who's been alienated from her community. Lonely but ever hopeful, Bryn finds solace within the walls of the home where she grew up until she's awakened one night by strange noises from decidedly unearthly intruders. What follows is an action-packed face-off between Bryn and a host of extraterrestrial beings who threaten her future while forcing her to deal with her past. It has been a while since a film has been brought up this much on the supergroup and sent to me via WhatsApp and sent to me via Instagram. People were equally like, please don't watch this film, you'll be terrified. And please watch this film, you'll be terrified. So of course, I sat down to watch this film. And as always, I'm going to start with the likes and then we'll move on to the dislikes. But in my likes column, so the first 10 minutes of this film, maybe slightly longer than 10 minutes, it probably actually was longer than 10 minutes. However long it took to establish the world and the beginning of the home invasion was absolutely petrifying. So firstly, the establishing of the world I thought was really well done. You have this woman, this young woman who is living in this idyllic, beautiful home. She seems to be like perfectly content on her own. But then when she has to go into town, she's actively trying to hide from people. People clearly don't like her and you don't know why and I thought the setup was really really good when we were watching this film so Nick and I watched it and honestly those first minutes of the home invasion where she wakes up and she realizes that there is a creature in the house 
It was terrifying. And I mean that in every sense of the word. So to be clear, when I say Nick, I mean Nick from the Poisoner's Cabinet, who is currently staying in my house for a little while. And he does not like horror films or scary films. Literally, he was saying, I'm not watching this. I'm going to bed. No, I'm, I can't. No, I'm, I'm going to bed. I'm not watching any more of this. I don't like it. It's too much. It got to a point where he was covering his eyes and I was narrating what was happening in the film to him because it was that terrifying for that period of time. And that sequence honestly made me feel like I was watching signs again for the first time, knowing that there was something in the house and being right there with her as she is simultaneously trying to figure out what's in the house while also trying not to get caught or discovered by this creature that she doesn't know what it is. Oh dear Lord above. It was so well done. A really interesting thing about this film was that there is virtually no dialogue in the film and it took me about halfway through to notice that it was happening or not happening as it were. So um, the woman who plays the lead role is Caitlin Deaver and she does this part incredibly well. She creates this well-rounded character with virtually no dialogue and I really liked her. I really liked her. You learn from early on that the people in the town hate her and she is portrayed as being lovely and creative and she's really trying to make her life work and I want to know what happened in her life that all these people in the town hate her and I I was actively rooting for her because while you see that she is fragile that something has happened to her that things have gone wrong she's also really strong and she's a great character to root for. There are various bits in this film where she is kicking the ever-living shit out of aliens and it reminded me of the scene in Dog Soldiers where Spoon is in the kitchen absolutely giving it everything he has trying to fight those werewolves. Throwing fucking pots and pans, throwing knives and forks, not knowing what's going on but just I'm going to fight until the bitter end. That's how I felt about her. And I, I, I've got to be on board with that, you know. As somebody who is not a fan of aliens, I am always going to be on board with somebody who is kicking the ever-living shit out of an alien using whatever they have at their disposal. And I'm really sorry to say that that's where my likes column ends. And judging by the comments on social media that I've seen about this film, I feel like I watched a different film to everybody else. You know, when I look at the fact that it is 80% on Rotten Tomatoes and 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb, let me tell you, I must have fallen asleep or I must have gone into an alternate universe where I watched a totally different film because I disliked huge amounts of this film. As I said, those first, that first part of the film where you realise that there's something in the house and she is trying to figure out what it is while simultaneously trying not to get caught by whatever it is. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. But the very second... I saw that alien the very second I saw its long little toes stretching down onto that carpet. I was over it. I was like, well, I'm not scared anymore because I've literally just I've seen it and I've seen too much of it. Now I'm just trying to figure out whether I could fight it in real life. And I feel like I could. The opening act really was the strongest. But then after that, I felt like it really lost its vibe. I thought it it just was this jumble of ideas and sort of hurtled through to the end without any real reflection on where it was actually going. Another thing that I thought was kind of interesting about the film was that when you eventually did get to see the aliens, there were all different shapes and sizes of aliens, and each shape and size of alien sort of brought a new challenge. That I liked, but it did feel like once the aliens were revealed, that as a viewer, I ended up just watching a weird endless cycle of cat and mouse where she's captured and released ad nauseum and I just got to the point where I was like I'm really rooting for you as a character but also I've gone beyond the point of caring and I know that some people will be listening to me slagging this film off and going you just didn't get it and maybe I didn't maybe I didn't but before your poised fingers over that keyboard start typing to send me all the reasons why it was a good film I just thought that there were too many threads that could have been promising, none of which were properly explored. As a story about unresolved trauma, 
about grief, about social isolation, about loneliness, about trying to fit in, about what you do when everybody sees you as something that you don't think you are. All of those themes are really strong, powerful themes in horror, really strong, powerful themes that can be explored in numerous different ways. But I just felt like none of them were explored properly. I thought that the film tried to do too much and didn't do any of it successfully. And I hated the ending. I despised it. I hated it with the power of a thousand fiery suns. And I was thinking to myself, I was rooting for you. No one will save you. We were all rooting for you. And you let me down by having a shit ending. So I'm really sorry to say it's two stars from me. But I'm not going to say not to watch it. Because, judging by social media and Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, lots of people seem to really like it. Is it worth a watch? Yes, it might be exactly your thing. I did not enjoy it, did not think it was my thing. I thought the first act was brilliant and it went downhill after that and I hated the ending. And fundamentally, although I like seeing aliens get the shit kicked out of them over and over again, it just didn't do it for me. And our story this week is, again... A story that has been highly and widely requested over the last few years. You can see by the title that our story is going to be about the cursed town of Dudley Town. So let's get into it. I don't like being told what to do. It's the inherent flaw of the youngest child. You tell me not to do something and I immediately want to do it. It's also the inherent flaw of most horror film protagonists. That do not enter sign that seems to be painted in blood triggers an indescribable need to enter rather than the sensible option which is to run away and don't look back. It's probably human nature. We have a desperate fear of missing out. What if there is something amazing in that clearly haunted demon building? We are also just curious and as the old adage goes... Curiosity killed the cat. Obviously, when I first heard about the topic of today's episode, I immediately thought, I need to go there. I am the person in the horror film that gets murdered first, clearly. But is there something about not being allowed to visit somewhere that makes it seem more haunted, more mysterious, more dangerous? Or... Is it actually more haunted, more mysterious and more dangerous? Approximately 100 miles north of New York City lies the New England town of Cornwall, Connecticut. It's a beautiful town, widely rural in places, bordered by the Housatonic River along the west and the Mohawk Mountains to the east. Much of the town encompasses the Mohawk State Forest, home to rugged hills, dense woodland and boggy wetland. It's described as a quiet town, the greenest in Connecticut, and perfect for those who are seeking a peaceful yet adventurous lifestyle. To the south of Cornwall, shrouded in the shadows of the nearby mountains and thick forests, lies the ruins of Dudley Town. Confusingly, Dudley Town was never actually a town, but an isolated village sunk in the middle of three large hills. The land was and is covered in woodland and has earth densely packed with rocks and stones. Any sunlight is obscured from the area by the nearby mountains, meaning Dudley Town is cast in near perpetual shadow. And all that's left of Dudley Town are cellar holes, stone fountains, narrow trails, and a curse. In the early 1900s, Dr. William Clark was on the hunt for a place to build what you might call his country home. He was tired, and his wife Harriet was tired. Dr. Clark was an oncologist in the city and taught as a professor in the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. 
Being an oncology doctor in the early 1900s was difficult. It was a time where radiation was only in its absolute infancy as a method to treat cancer, and Dr. Clark had watched so many patients wither away from the wretched disease and he was tired. He loved teaching. It brought him great joy to see bright-eyed new physicians coming up the ranks full of energy and anticipation, but he needed somewhere quiet. Somewhere where he could really decompress. This hunt brought him to Cornwall. Dr. Clark and Harriet were driving slowly down the dark and windy roads of the countryside. They crossed the Cornwall Bridge and then they saw it, their safe haven. They got out of the car and took in their surroundings. It was perfect. The edge of the forest, the edge of nowhere. The air was full of the sounds of nature. They could hear birds chirping and chattering. They could hear somewhere the trickling sound of water. They caught glimpses of deer through the trees and they knew that this place was home. It was darker in the forest. As the canopy stretched closed overhead and the sunlight dazzled through breaks in the leaves. Not only did this feel like home, but it felt like the closest to heaven that they could get to on earth. It was full of life. It was fresh and clean. It was as far removed from the hustle and the bustle of city life as they could get. It was perfect. When they returned to the city, Dr. Clark set about building his dream home in a clearing in the forest. He purchased land, enough land that they could build their new property while also enjoying the wilds of the woodland. Enough land that the house wouldn't be plagued by the darkness of the canopy. That was not, as it turned out, the only darkness that Dr. Clark should fear. The forest was known as Dark Entry Forest. It was easy for Dr. Clark to assume that this was because of the thick canopy that shrouded the world below it in shadow, but it wasn't just that. Try as he might, Dr. Clark could not find any local builder willing to work on his home. It was a relatively simple task for a local building company. Throw up a simple, modest cabin home in a clearing in the forest and that was it. But no. No one would do it. The reasons were vague and ambiguous, but rejection after rejection came. Strange. But Dr. Clark, of course, justified it in many different ways. Maybe local builders were simply too busy to take on this job. Maybe they were small town folk who were against big city outsiders coming onto their land and building their big houses. Maybe they would struggle to get materials in and out of the forest and it just wasn't worth the hassle. Whatever the reason, no one would budge and Dr. Clark decided that he would simply build the house himself. And he did. He spent months travelling between the city and dark entry forest, cutting down hemlock trees to provide the wood to build his retreat. And by all accounts, he did a wonderful job. He built a cabin that used a spring on the hillside to pump in fresh water. It was a simple two-storey cabin, but it was comfortable and cosy and surrounded by the energy of the forest and the wilderness. The Clarks spent time at the cabin, happily watching the seasons change in the forest around them until one fateful visit, where Dr. Clark was suddenly called back to New York for a few days to deal with a medical emergency. Suddenly for Harriet, the cabin didn't seem like the perfect, idyllic and cosy haven. Suddenly she was very aware that she would be alone in the cabin, isolated, with no one around, and the darkness of the forest seemed to get darker with the realisation. Dr. Clark left Harriet for 36 hours. That was it. 
36 hours that changed his life forever. 36 hours that would mean that for years to come, people like me would be telling his story. When he returned, Harriet was not waiting for him on the train platform at Cornwall Bridge. He had a sick feeling that was unfurling in the pit of his stomach. Something was wrong. He instinctively knew it and as he made his way towards the cabin, he fought the urge to run. The forest seemed dark. Was it always this dark? The sounds of the owls in the trees was deafening, a cacophony. As he approached the cabin, he realised with horror that the front door was ajar. This on its own would not have been concerning, but this coupled with the gnawing terror that was inside him seemed to be the worst thing he could have seen. As he approached the door, he heard it. He couldn't quite figure out what it was at first, but then he realised that it was laughter. High-pitched, loud, maniacal laughter reverberating through the house. He knew, logically, that it was Harriet, but he had never heard her make this sound before. This wasn't her laugh. Her laugh was raucous and breathy and joyful, but this was unnerving and almost impossibly high-pitched. She barely seemed to breathe. He paused for a split second with an instinctual feeling telling him to turn around and run as far and as fast away as he could. But instead he bolted up the stairs to where the sound was coming from. Harriet was lying on their bedroom floor. She was curled into a ball facing the door. Her eyes were wide and blank and her mouth gaped open as she laughed this high-pitched and terrible laugh. We will never know what happened to Harriet Clark in that 36 hours, but she eventually would talk about what happened to her. Things emerged from the forest. Strange and shadowy figures that she initially saw darting through the trees that came closer and closer to the house. Creatures that bled into the darkness of the forest, creatures that seemed to be at one with the forest. They came for her, and with their arrival, she lost her mind. In isolation, this is a story of a woman who had a mental health crisis in a forest alone and frightened. But perhaps if the Clarks had known the story of the land, they would have thought twice about building their countryside getaway there and would have taken more seriously the fact that no local builders would build there. Like a lot of New England villages, Dudley Town had its official roots in the early years of the transatlantic migration, but as with all of these stories, it is important to note that the land was occupied by native people first. It is recorded that the Mohawk Nation occupied the land as sacred ground. In 1747, a man named Gideon Dudley arrived in the area, buying much of the settlement's land. He and his family would provide the village with its name, but also its downfall because, you see, the Dudley family were cursed. A proper centuries-old, a plague on both your houses type of curse, which haunted generations of Dudleys, bringing misfortune and death wherever they went. Naturally, this meant that the prosperity and safety of Dudley Town and its residents was doomed from the start. Reports of the curse seem to have started in 1926 with the publication of a book called The History of Cornwall by a man named Edward Starr. He called the curse the doom of Dudley Town and outlined the family's long history of horror and death. The curse began in England in 1510 when Edmund Dudley was beheaded for conspiring to overthrow King Henry VIII, an act of treason so abhorrent 
that it began the generational curse that would later consume Dudley Town because of course King Henry VIII was an adherent to the concept of the divine right of kings. The monarchy was seen as only being answerable to God and they were God's representative on earth and that their right to rule was a result of divine authority. So to plot to overthrow the king was in a way an attack on God. And so the misfortune and suffering began. Edmund's son, apparently not learning from his father's lack of success with treason, was also beheaded with his son and daughter-in-law for trying to gain control of the English throne. Sometime later, another of Edmund's sons returned from war in France, bringing with him a plague of sickness which wiped out hundreds of people. And then, of course, a couple of hundred years later, in the 1700s, the Dudley descendants and their curse settled in Connecticut. After the Dudleys founded the village, reports of strange deaths and bizarre occurrences began to circulate. In 1792, a man named Gershon Hollister was murdered in a house next door to Abel Dudley. Near the end of his life, Abel lost his entire fortune and then went insane, dying soon after. But it was the nature of Abel's insanity that renders the story of Dr. Clark and his wife Harriet even more interesting. Abel Dudley claimed that shadowy creatures lurked in the forest, that these shadowy creatures flitted in between the tree line and were coming for him. Another local of Dudley Town, William Tanner, is said to also have gone mad telling the village's residents that strange creatures came out of the woods at night. He talked of the strange creatures to anyone who would listen, telling them that the strange shadowy creatures lurked in the tree line and were a danger to all the residents of Dudley Town. In the 1800s, a mysterious plague swept through Dudley Town. The Carter family, who had settled in Dudley Town, wanting to escape the plague which killed their relatives, moved away to the Delaware wilderness. But it was here that misfortune struck. Nathaniel Carter, his wife and one of his infant children, were killed by Native Americans in a brutal standoff, and his other three children were abducted and taken to Canada. In 1804, the curse of Dudley Town befell General Herman Swift and his family. His wife, Sarah Fay, left their home and was immediately struck by lightning, dying instantly. The grief was too much for General Herman Swift. He went insane and died shortly afterwards. Slowly, the already small population of the village began to dwindle, each death more horrifying than the last. In 1872, a local man named Horace Greeley was running for president. One week before he lost the election, his wife hanged herself in Dudley Town. In 1901, tragedy struck another Dudley Town family, the Brophy family. In quick succession, John Patrick Brophy's wife died of consumption, followed by the mysterious disappearance of his two children. The children were accused of stealing, vanished into the forest, never to be seen again. Now alone, Brophy's house burnt to the ground and he himself wandered into the forest and vanished, never to be seen again. And then in the 1900s, Dr. William Clark and his wife Harriet happened upon Dudley Town in their search for a place of peace and tranquility. But just how real was this curse? According to numerous sources, not real at all. Since the publication of Starr's book in the 1920s and its rise to prominence in popular culture, people started to debunk the apparent curse and strange stories surrounding Dudley Town. 
Dudley Town existed. The ruins are still there in the forest and you can still see them to this day. Reverend Gary Dudley, a direct descendant of the Dudley Town Dudleys, wanted to debunk his family curse. And in 1999, he and the Cornwall Historical Society concluded their lengthy research. Apparent murder victim Gershon Hollister, neighbour of Abel Dudley, wasn't murdered at all. He fell from a roof rafter to his death. There is also no proof that any of the residents of Dudley Town went insane. Abel Dudley lived until he was 90 years old. Senile, but otherwise healthy. The three Carter children who were kidnapped by Native Americans survived their ordeal, with one of them ultimately becoming a state Supreme Court judge. General Herman Swift never lived in Dudley Town. Neither did Horace Greeley or his wife. And Dr. Clark's wife did tragically take her own life, but did so due to suffering from severe chronic pain not due to an attack from strange woodland creatures. In some ways, it is true that Dudley Town was doomed from the start, but not for the reasons that Edward Starr would lead you to believe. The village itself was never going to succeed due to its geographical location. As I mentioned before, it got very little sun and had rocky soil, which couldn't support farmland or livestock very well. According to records, the village only ever consisted of houses. It had no shop, no school, no church. It wasn't really a desirable or sustainable place to live. Most importantly though, it turned out that the Dudleys of Dudley Town had no connection whatsoever to the beheaded noblemen in England, meaning that the curse couldn't have begun there in the first place. However, people still believe that the area holds some kind of dark power or energy. As I mentioned earlier, the legends surrounding Dudley Town emerged back into public consciousness and popular culture during the 20th century. After the death of his wife, Dr. Clark remained in the local area and eventually helped to start the Dark Forest Entry Association in 1924 the purpose of which was to make sure the forests surrounding the village stayed wild. The association purchased most of the land in and around Dudley Town. I guess this didn't exactly help the rumours of mysterious happenings with a name like Dark Forest Entry, but Clark and his team were referring more to the physical darkness of the place rather than any paranormal activity. As the site that was Dudley Town was now private land, left to become overgrown and wild, people began to visit the ruins of the village. People began to report being touched by invisible hands. Some people felt themselves being poked. Some people felt themselves being slapped in the face. People reported seeing mysterious floating lights and feeling overwhelming terror when visiting the ruins. According to some, satanic rituals began taking place in the ruins and the nearby woods. Some started to believe that the area was a negative power spot, a place where supernatural entities enter our world from the other side. Reports of ghost sightings began in the mid 20th century but were overwhelmingly increased in the 1970s by everyone's favourite paranormal power couple, Ed and Lorraine Warren. In the 1970s, the Warrens videotaped a Halloween special from Dudley Town, declaring it demonically possessed and controlled by something terrifying. It didn't help Dudley Town's reputation when, in 1983, a film crew who decided to film in the town found that none of their equipment worked whilst in the ruins. The film crew's reporter also became violently ill while trying to tell the story of the village on camera. Reports of ghostly activity continued into the late 20th century, coinciding with the breakout popularity of forest-based horror movie The Blair Witch Project in 1999. 
The release of this movie prompted tourists and ghost hunters into the apparently haunted woods and ruins of Dudley Town. Due to the negative interest in their private land, the Dark Forest Entry Association decided to close their land to the public for good. In 1999, the association decreed that people were now forbidden to enter their nature reserve, officially meaning that tourists to the area were illegally trespassing and subject to police intervention. In fact, in 2011, local police arrested eight filmmakers who strayed off the public roads and onto private property. Arguably, the secrecy and seclusion of the now ruined village has done little to discourage beliefs that the place is haunted. Some still hold firm in their belief that Dudley Town was, and is, a village of the damned. Not only have I seen Dudley Town being requested numerous times over the years, whether it's on Instagram stories when I say, hey, what do you want to see me cover? People will inevitably always say Dudley Town. And people will email me and say, have you seen this? Have you heard of this story? And they'll send me links to like articles all about Dudley Town. And it's also all over social media. It's all over TikTok, Instagram Reels. People are talking about Dudley Town and people continue to talk about Dudley Town. But the stories about Dudley Town, it would seem, simply aren't true. That's not to say that people haven't had paranormal experiences there. I need to make that very clear. I'm not saying that people who go there in the modern time who have paranormal experiences are lying or making it up. Maybe they do. But the original stories, the stories about people going insane, seeing things coming out of the forest, people taking their own lives in Dudley Town, those stories simply aren't true. And I wonder if part of the reason why these stories have continued for years and years and years is because the people in the stories are real people. Dudley Town really existed. The ruins are still there. It's just the stories themselves about these people aren't necessarily true. So you've got, for example, Abel Dudley's neighbour. Now, everywhere that I looked at this, it was A-B-I-E-L, so Abiel maybe, but it seemed to be pronounced as Abel everywhere that I heard it on videos, etc. So I'm thinking maybe it is Abel, but if I've got it wrong, I'm very sorry. But his neighbour is said to have been murdered when in actuality he had a terrible accident, fell from roof rafters and died. But you can see how a terrible accident like that might cause whispers of, but was he murdered? And I don't mean this in any kind of flippant way, but as humans, we love a good story. And somebody being murdered is a juicier story than somebody falling from the rafters and dying. The fact that Dr. Clark's wife Harriet, the fact that she did take her own life because of a chronic pain condition is, I think, somehow even more terrifying than creatures coming from the forest because living with a chronic pain condition that is that horrific that the only way you see out of it is to take your own life is astounding and terrifying and of course it does happen in real life, I'm sorry to say and I think actually that is probably more terrifying and I wonder if it's possible that some of these stories about Dudley Town and about the curse and the dangers of being in the forest and the creatures that are lurking in the forest, I wonder if part of that was about keeping children out of the forest, you know? You know, those urban legends that keep children safe or those paranormal stories that keep children safe, you know, like we have stories of La Llorona where you say, well, if you go out at night or if you go down near the water at night, La Llorona is going to get you. And while it is obviously a very important part of paranormal cultural folklore, there is an element as well of keeping children safe and keeping children out of danger. And we know from countless stories that these huge, huge expanses of forest can be really dangerous because people go in, they get turned around, they can't find their way out, they get lost, they're out in the elements, it gets really cold. Whatever the case may be, they can be incredibly dangerous for people. And I'm going to be really honest. I did not know that Ed and Rain Warren were, were connected to Dudley Town. And it's like that that thing, I think it's in the first Conjuring movie, that joke that the presenter on TV makes about 
Ed Warren that Ed Warren never went into a house that wasn't haunted. And you all know my feelings on Ed and Lorraine Warren. They were entertainers. They knew how to make a book. And I think it would be a very poor Halloween special if they went to Dudley Town and said it wasn't haunted, that it was just a creepy abandoned town in the middle of the forest. Of course, of course they are going to say it is demonic and controlled by something really dark. And it feels like Dudley Town is sort of the perfect storm to create a good paranormal story. However, there are, as I mentioned, stories of people who have gone to Dudley Town, who have snuck onto the site. And as I said, it is illegal. You will get in trouble if you do so. It is private property. Please don't, on account of this podcast, go and try and find Dudley Town and get yourself into some sort of legal bother. But there are reports of people who have gone to the Dudley Town region, into the forest, felt themselves being slapped, felt themselves being pushed, seen floating lights and had that overwhelming feeling of terror and panic. Like, is it possible that there just is something in the forest? And maybe the stories about Dudley Town and the stories about shadowy creatures that lurk in the tree line have just been intermingled together when they didn't actually have anything to do with each other. But Dudley Town and the curse of Dudley Town and the horrors that allegedly befell the people of Dudley Town were a way to tell the stories of the things that lived in the forest and to tell them in a way that could properly demonstrate the horror of not respecting the forest in the way maybe that you should. It was interesting that the land where Dudley Town was built was recorded as being a place of ritualistic importance, of sacred importance for the Mohawk tribes. Now, I tried to kind of look up what that actually means. So what does it mean that the land is sacred to the Mohawk people? And I didn't really get any definitive answers. I do know that the Mohawk tribes had 13 different celebrations throughout the year and that those celebrations were said to be representative of new moons and different types of moons and that it was all very nature based and about respecting nature and showing respect for nature. So I don't really, but I don't really know what sacred ground actually means, whether it means some of the rituals or some of the celebrations took place in that ground or it was a ground an area of land that you just left alone, that you let it do its thing because it was sacred and important. I don't know. And then another part of me wonders, well, if something is believed to be haunted, believed to be a cursed village, believed to be a forest where shadowy things lurk, do we really start to think that shadowy things do lurk there? Do we start to see shadowy things that lurk there because we believe it so much? But here's my takeaway from this. Do I believe that Dudley Town was cursed? No. Do I believe that Dudley Town is haunted in the traditional sense? No. Do I think that scary things lurk in the forest that we should not be messing with? Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. And thank you to all of the people throughout the years who have suggested Dudley Town as an episode topic. If you have an episode topic that you think, oh, I'd really like you to cover this, do feel free to send me an email or an Instagram message, preferably an email because I don't read Instagram messages very often and let me know what that topic is that you would really like to be covered on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening and if you would like to send in your own spooky story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com and if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories where for $5 a month or $2 a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.